fun and informative podcast all about training working dogs? Look no further than the LWDG Pod Dog. This weekly show is hosted by me, Joe Parrott, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I chat to experienced trainers and experts in the field who will give you helpful tips and advice. Whether you're just getting started or you've been working with dogs for years, this podcast will have something for you. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a cup of coffee and tune in to LWDG Pod Dog. Let us help you build a better bond with your best friend. Welcome to another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. Today we're going to be talking all about grouse counting. Joining me on this podcast is Lucy Hall. And we've also got with us our amazing LWDG Regional Coordinator, Sue Lister. Welcome both. Welcome, Lucy. Now, I know you're going to chat through with us everything about grouse counting. But before you start, tell us a little bit about your background. Okie dokie. Yeah, so basically, I've grown up uh, with my dad working English pointers and setters. Um, and so, and he's trialled them. We've shot over them. And obviously grouse counting. Um, I didn't really get into having my own dog until, oh gosh, how how old was I? About seven years ago, I got my own English setter. Um, But I'd always been dog boy to my dad, just holding the dogs, going out and watching and everything. Um, So it's basically been part of my life. Every holiday, we've always been up on the moors or in the partridge fields with the dogs and and helping uh, train as well. So, yeah, for the last, I suppose, seven years with my English setter, I've been off um, grouse counting. I've also shot over her as well and run her for a couple of shooting parties. Um, and now I actually have a 10 month old English setter who I'm training up as well. So, um, yeah, so we, we actually will be going off. Uh, I've been grouse counting for the last four, four years, I'd say. I will wait until I go into that and say a bit more about it. But um, I will be heading off up to the moors. Uh, can't wait for a, in about a month's time um, in March. So, uh, yeah, off up to Scotland and northern England. So which will be really exciting. So we've got the perfect expert to talk to us on this topic. Now, before I start you on talking about the topic, so mm. have you been involved in grouse or grouse counting at all? Or are you as fascinated as I am? I'm fascinated. There are a lot of grouse on the moor near where I live. Um, But no, apart from them like shooting out in front of me as I walk across the moor, no, I know nothing about counting them. Joining us a little bit into our call is the amazing Emma Stevens. Emma, do you know anything about grouse counting or has your recent move to Cumbria sort of started off this fascination? Um, So I was aware that it happened um, and I know roughly how it works, um, but no, I've never done it before. I've never been on a grouse moor before. I'm very much a pheasant and partridge shoot um, kind of person. Um, I would love to, since coming up to Cumbria, I would love to get more into grouse um, and go and pick up on grouse moors and things like that. and possibly go and watch watch some counting um, because it is it's fascinating. Um, so I'm really excited to listen to what Lucy has to say about it. So let's start at the beginning. What is grouse counting? Okie date. So basically, we are helping the keepers um, get an idea of how many birds they've got for their shooting uh, period once the glorious 12 comes around. So we do two counts, one in March when we're counting the pairs. And then another count in around July time when we've got the broods. And basically it gives, obviously, counting the pairs, it gives them an idea of how many broods they've got they're going to possibly get. Um, Also, um, because obviously they'll be in pairs, cocks and hens, you can also get a feel because quite often there will be um, single cocks and they'll get just get an idea of actually how many breeding pairs they've got. Um, Obviously, then when we go on to the broods, um you know it's good to see what sizes they are how healthy they are um and normally that yes that's around mid july time so a month before the glorious 12th um and obviously over the last well few seasons i must say most places it, it has been quite hit hard and so a lot of places have stopped shooting um and they've only allowed perhaps you know walked up days or dogs o- uh, sorry days over uh, points and setters um so yeah so before we went further just for me to understand because this is like literally how inexperienced i am by this whole topic whereas we put pheasants down as poults and they are you know they're not bred in the end 
environment really on the most are grouse all wild yeah all completely wild they 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 don't um I don't think many people try but they don't really breed very well in uh captivity so all grouse yeah they're just completely wild um so obviously they do get affected by weather plays a huge impact um there's also the the um heather beetle there's all a few uh, bits and pieces up on the moors that you you know the keepers have to obviously keep an eye on which is why we get heather burning um obviously some places now you can't you can, they're not allowed to do it um but it, it's all management um and like everything uh the moors need to be managed to keep these keep these birds alive and also keep all the diversity there so the shoot season that starts in the august really depends on how well the count goes um with the with the pairing and and the broods really then so they work backwards whereas we work forwards so we we know what dates we're having based on the amount of birds that we put down and you work kind of backwards a little bit you put as many days on as you've got birds exactly and so what will happen is um quite often um estates will start getting uh, grouse dates booked in even in September, October, November, once say uh, some people have shot. But what norm- what, well, what's happened over the last few seasons is sadly, yes, people have got booked on, but then once the counts get done, I mean, most keepers don't make a decision unless it's dire in the, in the spring um, and the pairs are, ru- are really bad and it's, it's awful. They'll make the decision then and there to say, right, no, we can't do do any shooting otherwise they'll wait until the um uh, brood counts are done and then they have to make a decision from that whether they're going to shoot whether they're going to cancel half of them um where i go um it's a family estate so uh, they don't tend to do many um paid commercial days so what they tend to do is just limit the the uh, family down to a few days uh it just depends on on what's on what's been counted First of all, from an environmental perspective, in order for grouse shooting to take place, it, it absolutely requires management and care for the land because literally without it, you aren't putting down birds. You literally have to know the whole ecosystem on those moors is working efficiently for the birds to breed. Absolutely. So that's obviously the, the keepers are going out, that are uh, culling the prey. Uh, of the of the grouse um that needs a lot of management um but also that um contribution of uh looking after the you know doing the management for the grouse is also helping a load of other um bird and animal species as well um it's it, i suppose like everything to make an ecosystem work you need a good balance and equilibrium and that's exactly what uh, you know the keeper's job is to do so my second question on that then is obviously whereas a lot of fairs and shooting can be, you know, it can go from family run, small syndicates, all the way up to, to large, large corporate estates. If you take part in grouse shooting, it really is a very small amount of days, a very expected small bags, as in you're not getting anywhere near the numbers because you didn't put them down in the beginning. Um, it is a completely different type of shooting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, going back to uh, how the how the numbers are, I mean, you can have driven days and it depends on uh, some grouse moors um, like Bolly Hope in the northern England. They are renowned for having amazing days and they will shoot seriously thousands um, in a good year. Other estates um, may, you know, may just not have as many. Um, and so they might shoot a lot less. And so sometimes as um so what they'll do is they might do a few driven days because, sorry, going back, the grouse shooting season is from the 12th of August to, I'm, I'm going to say 8th of December, but don't hold me on that. But it is something around uh, that time. And so um, what they'll do is they'll otherwise do walked up days. Um, so walked up days are obviously over the Spaniels, labs, HPRs. Um, and then I what I do is... Um, the more I suppose absolute traditional way is over the points and satters, that's English pointers and satters. And there you're right. We used to book days for like 10 brace because not being funny for me, it's all about working the dogs, watching the dogs and everything. And you don't need many more. You only have a one gun, uh, sorry, two guns up with one dog. Um, and that's all that's running at a time. And 
to be fair, you know, you walk a lot. <laughs> You've got, you know, these dogs do uh, cover long, you know, wide distances and everything. So you do um, walk a lot. And so you don't actually need, um, you're, you're doing a bit of conservation in, in your in itself anyway because you're always being asked to shoot the old cocks which are the ones that fly up first um if you that's if you can it's a world i've grown up in um something i feel quite passionate about as well obviously working with the satyrs and pointers and um it's a it's sadly it's a dying it's a dying thing because driven shooting has taken has taken over um and so a lot of estates especially in scotland used to have huge kennels of setters and pointers i mean 80 to 100 dogs and they'd either use them on their own estates or otherwise they'd go and uh, rent them out to other estates and handlers to run them for shooting parties and we just don't have that anymore um you know driven shooting has taken over and to be fair there's only really now a window of probably three or four weeks uh, from the glorious 12th for yeah about four weeks where you can really actually have good days over the dogs because the grouse then get jumpy, they get wild. You just, the dogs just can't get close enough to them before they're starting to, uh, to pin them down so that, um, you know, guns can get up close enough to actually shoot them. So it just, I mean, I've have gone shooting in October time, but then you might, you, you're lucky if you get two or three birds, but you know, that's the, it, that's the beauty of it. As you're explaining it to me, I'm thinking, you know, my mind is thinking, oh, wow, because, you know, again, with pheasants, you, you roughly got an idea what drives they're going to be on because they've been encouraged to stay near or close to those drives or in those drives. You're going out onto the moors and those birds have got nobody really telling them where they should or shouldn't be or what, do, you know, where they should be eating, what they should be doing. So you are really, truly, truly hunting. Yes. I mean, the other thing about grouse is they do hold territories. So right. it keep, I mean, keepers will know their moors very well. And so quite often they will, um, once having counted a particular moor for, or a particular count for, say, a couple of years, they will know that this particular cockbird um, will, they, it should be in a certain area. So it's amazing. I can be walking, uh, going out on a count and the keeper i always go out with the keeper and the keeper will say oh that's a bit weird we haven't seen you know there should be two or three cop birds around here that's very strange you know if you haven't seen them so they do hold territories and um you very rarely do they go into um other territories um so they very much hold it uh but obviously keepers the more and more they do their counts um and they get to know where the grass are it's, uh, it's amazing i mean the, they've got such a wide expanse of ground to cover um but they really do do know it so yeah quite amazing so what does a like a day counting look like so if you were if you were going up for day counting what would it look like mm -hmm. like when would it start when would it when would you hope to be finished by what kind of ground would you cover what would you be expecting to do on that day good question um it all i mean it depends on how many dogs you've got Generally, for a, I and mean, then I'm talking obviously about counting with pointers and setters. Um, just going back, you can, the dogs that are, in, are used for counting, um, you can have pointers and setters, HPRs, even, you know, spaniels and labs. Um, I think probably, I mean, I, I, ha, I haven't done it personally with my spaniels. Um, I think it's probably easiest for keepers to do it with dogs that point because the, uh, obviously the dogs will then hold the, <laughs> hold the birds. And then you, the handler can walk up, the keeper can go up if they want, but then the dogs, um, you know, flush them uh, methodically. So it's there easier to count. Whereas obviously when you've got uh, spaniels and labs, I, I do know a girl up in um, uh, North Yorkshire who goes out with her spaniels and labs and she's got a team of a, a bit like you, Emma, has got eight or 10 dogs that she's working. And I know she goes out and helps with the counts, but when you've got it like that, they're all strewn across. And I mean, birds must just, just be going up. So you've got to really keep your eyes open. Whereas I think with obviously the pointing breeds, um, it's a lot easier because obviously, as I said, they're holding the, uh, holding the birds. I I mean, obviously I'm biased, <laughs> but the points and setters are probably, uh, the, and I'd say the English pointers because they're a separate subbreed um, from the HPRs, is that they're probably better because they cover, um, and I'll probably get to, uh, you know, 
told off for this, but they probably cover the ground better. Uh, they're faster. Um, and so you can get, I think keepers probably prefer uh, faster running dogs just because you can get more, more done. Um, so starting with a typical day. So generally you would want about four dogs for a count uh, because you're running one, one at a time. Um, and depending upon uh, the weather and what it's like, obviously whether you're in the summer and it's really hot, you, you might even want to take a, an, another dog out with you um, because you just need to be conscious of how your dogs are running. They can run, the terrain is, um, the terrain where I go is hard. I mean, it's seriously boulder-like. It's in Lancashire um, on the Abbey Stead Estate and they, it is very bouldery, um, lots of uphill, downhill, um, what have you. Other estates um, that I've been on in North Yorkshire, they are, it's, you know, it's not flat, but it's a lot easier. So uh, less work for dogs. Um, so on a typical day for me, I'll do two counts. Um, and generally the counts can take an hour and a half, two hours, depending upon the size of them. We'll then give the dogs a, um, an hour's break and then we do another one. So we, we could, again, it depends on the um, on the weather and what it's like. If it's really hot in the summer, we'll start at six o'clock in the morning. Um, and then we might actually do one count. If it's really hot, we'll wait and uh, do a count in the evening. So I normally take, um, I give myself, give the keepers two or three days um, where I go and I will be counting every day. Um, sadly, I don't have a big enough team to do any more um, but also generally I tack on my counting the counting coincides with trials and stuff so I'm up in the area because I'm actually from south uh, from the south in Oxfordshire so I'm always trekking up up north and um, so I kind of time it and if I've been doing quite a lot of trials and stuff it actually I don't want my you know my dog could be absolutely knackered um, and all of that or if, if before if I'm counting before going to trials, then I actually don't want to do too many, uh, too much counting. And so what I actually do is I end up borrowing friends dogs to add on into my team um, and uh, yeah, make up the numbers. Most people listening will know where an English setter is. Um, they're beautiful dogs. Was it bred to be on the moors doing this exact job? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, all the, all setter breeds and pointers, the work, it, obviously, you know, the working strain very much was. Um, they're bird scenting dogs um, and uh, they are bred to run wide distances um, and basically finding birds for you. That's what they want to do. Um, and they will run until they are. I mean, they are absolutely exhausted just because they just want to find that game. Um, and they're, yeah, they're amazing, very clever dogs to watch. And this it's interesting, though, because between each subbreed pointer. English Setter, Irish Setter, Irish Red and White and Gordon, there are different characteristics uh, that are different in each. Um, and it's actually really interesting because I've grown up obviously watching English Setters and English Pointers. And yeah, it's very interesting watching the different the different traits come through. I mean, I've got uh, two Springers as well. Um, and it actually, someone said to me, they're actually quite similar, English setters and springers. And it is true in a way, though obviously one lot you have to keep close, the other lot you want to uh, get running. But they both have that kind of, just we want to get on. <laughs> There's no patience, we, yeah, we just want to get on, so uh, yeah. yeah. I find it so interesting that probably only on grouse now you find this still kind of borrowing of each other's dogs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, in, in pheasant and partridge shoots, like you have your team of dogs and I, I couldn't think of anything worse than giving my dogs to somebody, even if they knew what they were doing with them on a pheasant day, I would think that they would ruin them. Whereas actually it, it's quite the norm for, for grouse keepers to share each other's dogs. And if you're having a day counting, you'll go and help out another grouse keeper count and then vice versa. Whereas it you don't seem to have that same kind of um, camaraderie, I guess, um, where you're willing to help each other in the pheasant in the pheasant and partridge world um, as much as you do across different grouse moors. So, yeah, I find that really interesting that you're prepared to share dogs and stuff. And actually, I've been very lucky because the few dogs that I have borrowed, one uh, came from a great friend and, yeah, she ran actually really well for me. And um, another t uh, three I borrowed, um, they actually from a friend who sadly she was ill so she couldn't she had quite a large kennel of about 20 dogs and uh, those I uh, actually no, I used four one was an absolute 
bugger, absolute brute, the brother of one of mine. And um, I was supposed to trial him the next day. And I said, sorry, sorry, it's not going to happen. Uh, but one of her Irish setter, I just clicked with. He was just an absolute dream. Um, and it's just, yeah, it is. It's really nice. But also, I've actually really enjoyed working dogs um, that obviously are trained and I take them on. And it's amazing how quickly I've managed to um, just, you know, get that partnership going, um, which has been, yeah, just really, really lovely. So when you talk about obviously how the the count affects the season and now I'm talking to you, I can understand the massive importance of the count. Um, and plus, I'm sure many people listening to this will think what a ethical way to do it you know you're you're genuinely working with with what's on the ground and and being sympathetic to what's happening environmentally each year but you say there's sort of a, been a, a minimization or a decrease in the amount of sort of walked up shooting that's going on etc is that then affecting the dog breeds are the setters etc are there are smaller numbers being bred yes absolutely i mean now um Obviously, I know my the English setter. I mean, you get what a hundred, a hundred and forty uh, English setters um, now bred in the UK, possibly a year, and they are on, on the endangered uh, dogs list. And the majority of those are show bred. And I'm sorry, that's going into another thing because the pointer and setter breeds now are very much two, uh, sadly two separate breeds, work and show. Um, you do get obviously um, some dogs that are bred half and half. Uh, which is fine but if if say I'm wanting for what I want not being funny I wouldn't go through show breeding um, because they just don't the confirmation isn't there they don't you know it's they're heavy dogs bred purely for the show ring there's a lot a lot of coat and all the rest of it um, what I want in my dogs is ones that are going to be fast they're pacey they're stylish they've got good nose they're, they're intelligent um, and all the rest of it um, and so very much now the yeah there are they are two separate breeds sadly um in many ways and because the and also they're not like with spaniels and labs you can go and train them anywhere you know you, all you need is a scrub bit of ground say for some spaniels and labs if you know absolute minimum um with a setter and a pointer you need ground <laughs> not just for exercising but for training and also training I mean, I've spent so, so much time going around asking farmers and landowners, do you mind if I can, you know, use use your ground? And it's very difficult because obviously, and also, or otherwise keepers, <laughs> it's really difficult because quite often they go, uh, no, because we're going to be using this for shooting, we're going to be doing this. And then I say, well, actually, I'm really interested in your ground because I've been seeing a lot of hairs on it. I want to train my dog on some hairs. No, sorry. Uh, if you you get seen uh, running there, I'll get the courses on because they think they can hit it. So it's very difficult. And I think that's also um, the numbers, num number of people wanting these dogs um, is, it, you know, it's a lot, uh, a lot lower and it's um, reduced. Also, I think the fact that the use of these dogs um, through the year, there isn't actually um, a long period of time. We don't have the six months of the shooting season for the um, uh, like the labs and spaniels. Um, you can't. I mean, people you can use them for woodcock and all the rest of it, um, and people do, and people do actually use them on general shoots. But it, that's not their natural environment. Um, so we tend to, you know, it is when the when you're used using them for the grouse or through the grouse shooting season, um, you can use. We do use them occasionally on the partridge. But most now partridge uh, shoots obviously are commercial. They don't want uh, the dogs on them. And also, once the once the um, partridge have been shot a bit, they they of course get jumpy as well, and you can't get dogs close to the birds. So yeah. When you compare figures like hundreds of setters uh, being registered, compare that then to the kennel club. I think it was 2020, 83,000 cocker pups. That is you can see there is a massive problem, isn't it? That's like, they are worlds apart in numbers. Where, you know, you, you talk about them sort of being endangered. If people are listening to this and, and are, are interested in, in potentially, you know, is this something that can do? If you like fairs and shooting, you can sort of find somebody who goes fairs and shooting or, or beat her or pick her up or, uh, you know, and you can sort of get in yourself. Like you said, you want a small amount of land to train. How does somebody even get involved in being part of a grow shoot? Um, 
I think probably the best thing to do is, um, I mean, if, it does help, obviously, if, if you live up in the uh, live up near a, a grouse moor. Um, but if you are, I would go in and ask, see if you can go and beat beat on a grouse moor um, on the grouse shoots and find out that way. Um, and um, but if you're wanting to say go along the um, possibly interested in the Saturn pointer world um, and working those kind of dogs, then I would probably say come along. Um, I think our, a lot of I would say come along to the, uh, the trials because the trials are very we're very close community. There's not many of us obviously who who do it, um, and uh, we have trials in uh, Suffolk, Norfolk. Uh, for the partridge and then northern England and Scotland for the grouse um, and it's actually the the closest uh, way of seeing um, the dogs working in the natural environment um, and uh, there's a lot of people there who are very uh, knowledgeable and exceedingly welcoming um, and there's actually quite a few people and I've met quite a few people through the LWDG actually who have got um, young satyrs and pointers um, who I've you know helped out and put them in touch with people to um you know take their dogs further and um there's, tra there's a couple of training days not as many as um sadly with uh for the labs and spaniels but there are out there frustratingly there's not a, there's we don't have any um I was going to say commercial trainers but you know you know there's plenty of gun dog trainers but because of these breeds they're just in the minority um, and they do need specialist training. It's completely different training to um, all of your other breeds like, um, and the HPRs and labs and spaniels. Um, you do need people that actually know and understand them uh, because they they do take a long time to mature. Um, it's amazing. You know, we call them pups. And I mean, dogs are pups until they're about two. But in our case, it definitely is like that. Um, it, but once you have them going, I mean, I could just watch them all day I do, and follow them all day. It's, yeah. I think I think it was yourself who shared with me some videos, didn't you, of, of them working. Mm. I was just like, just the, the speed of them and the ground they cover and how quickly they cover it and how, how much of a bond they must have with their handler, that their handler has trained them to be that far away and still listen and still be under control because you are talking a whole field they run from one side to the other, not they, you know, they they're 20 or 30 foot each side of you. If people want to find out more from you, uh, can they contact you? How does that work? But also, I whilst I've got you here and you've so lovingly given your time to talk about this topic, I, you know, please feel please feel free to plug a little bit about your business because your mm -hmm. your your business is not all dogs, is it? Not at all. Complete, completely the opposite. I would love to do uh, my, uh, yeah, I uh, have an events company and work a lot with corporates and privates doing completely the opposite, you know, parties and conferences and team offsites and experiences and retreats kind of thing. Um, I have in the past tried to get people, you know, um, I've also tried to kind of sell I suppose uh, a bit of you know grouse shooting over the dogs and everything uh but sadly people tend to always want the driven shooting um but I would love to do you know organize more kind of shoots and everything or you know that kind of outdoor stuff for people um but uh yeah people are more than welcome to uh get in touch with me because I could seriously talk about this all day and I I would love to I would love to encourage more and more people to um if they've got setters and pointers who you know, and just don't know what to do with them and uh, and everything. Um, I would love to just encourage more people to kind of get involved and, um, you know, uh, work, you know, whether they want to work them in any shape or form, because they are fabulous dogs. They are, they're tricky when you don't know um, what's in front of you and you're like, oh my God, this thing just is not listening. It's not doing what I'm wanting. Um, it's not, you know, it's not sitting and staying at 12 weeks old or whatever. It's jumping around like a loon. Um, but I mean, my youngster, he's at six months old. I finally managed to get him to sit and stay and, and walk away at two paces. And I was absolutely thrilled. <laughs> because, you know, it's like that. Um, but no, I, you can contact, people can contact me through Instagram, um, Messenger, um, my if people want my mobile, I'm gladly give it. And people are more than welcome just to give me a call and uh, I'll happily have a chat.
And and you really do know your stuff because I'm right in saying you're a judge as well, aren't you? Well, I'm a trainee judge. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a makey learny. Um, I've I've actually now I've uh, judged two trials. I did a two day uh, trial last summer in Yorkshire on the grouse, and then I did a a day on the partridge. And I've got coming up in March. I've got a two day trial on the grouse, and then I've got a two day trial um, in April on the partridge in Suffolk. Um, so yeah I've I've still uh, we have to take I think now we have to take an exam to get on the judging panel and see you have an A and a B, B panel so yeah the aim is to get onto the B obviously otherwise I remain a makey learny um, oh. yeah. I, I, do, well, I think the fact that you're already even as a makey learny judging says um, an amazing amount about your skill and your your real life business I look for your pig your pictures on Instagram and I think I want to be a PA I just want to wander around behind her in all these lovely old girls and just take take notes for you <laughs> because you go to some of the most amazing places for the people that obviously are completely novice to this could you just explain the difference between the setters the pointers and the HPRs just so that everybody understands how they work and what the difference is between them because probably people will think oh, well, as long as it points, it's it, they're all the same kettle of fish, basically, and, and that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, quite often, because I say pointers and setters, people obviously people automatically think, because I've mentioned pointers, there must be an HPR group. But yes, what we've got is, um, you've obviously got your Spaniels and Labs as, as a group, um, and then you've got HPRs, German pointers, Spinonis, Bimaranas, everything. And then there's the English pointer and the setters are just uh, in a completely extra subgroup of their own. Um, with our sets and pointers, they do, they can retrieve. I know people who do retrieve with them, but we generally don't. Um, whereas obviously the HPR says what it is, hunt point retrieve dogs. Um, whereas the setters and pointers, I'd say um, just, uh, I suppose they just, you work them a lot wider even than the HPRs um our, our lot also don't they they do enjoy swimming but we don't have to we don't have to do that um their work is mainly just to go out and find that game for you um and it's just running long distance wide wide quartering just to get out and find that game what we generally do um is that i suppose on a shoot day we will then bring in um spaniels and labs to do the retrieving for us Though, as I said, there are people um, who, friends of mine, who, who um, have turned their setters into HPRs effectively because they get them to retrieve as well. And am I right in saying that your the HPRs versus the pointers and setters, their point as such is is a little bit different as well? So a HPR point is looks would look slightly different to a setter's set? Yes. So, yeah, it's an HPR, you, I suppose they're very much upright. They've still got that leg lifted up. Um, a, an English pointer's point is very much like an HPR point in, in look. Whereas the setters, um, particularly my, my bitch, she crouches low. So setters are very much more cat-like and feline in the way they are. Um, and that is a, a different trait, obviously, to the pointer's. And that's I'm saying pointers as in collective being English pointers and the HPRs. Um, so she will really crouch down low and, and set. Um, other setters will actually stand as well. And it's interesting. I'm starting to see not that I've put him on any game yet. Um, he has had a back on a lark on um, my old one. But my youngster, who is actually a lot bigger, he's like the size of a Shetland pony, to be, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, he is I'm starting to see what his points are going to be like and he is he won't crouch I think he's going to stay upright um so it'll be interesting just to see see what happens there um, but that's where the, the sort of um you know the names come from lots of different things but the said uh, in in tradition that was a job it would set it would set it up for the person to shoot and then they would send their retrievers hence retrievers each dog had a certain function you know, the idea, we go on about a multi-use dog now being a dog that can shoot on a sat, you know, be, pick up on a Saturday and then go to Cami Cross on a Monday. Back in, in time, each dog had a very specific role to net. Exactly. And I think that's probably why setters, and I'm going to say English pointers here, uh, to differentiate, are probably 
um, less popular because they're not a um, they're not an all round dog. The HPRs do and Spaniels and Labs do everything, you know, can do everything, everything pretty much you want. You know, you can go out rough shooting with, uh, with any of those dogs and, you know, you get your the dog flushes. It, you, you know whether it points or not but it flushes gets the bird up you shoot it you can use that same dog to retrieve um whereas with the setters and english pointers their function yes is very much set or point um flush the birds and then yeah you bring in a you bring in a retriever because as i said they can retrieve but it's not natural and you can't rely on them necessarily uh to do that but, you know, for example, like Spaniel and Retriever, this might be my ignorance around this whole topic now. Obviously, I understand they flush birds. I understand all that. But th- can they hold a bird or can you train them to point or set and not flush until you get there? Sorry, Do for you know? Spaniels and Labs? Or- yeah. I'm not sure, actually. I have heard of people say they have had a Spaniel or a Lab that's actually pointed the birds. Um. So that'd be actually really interesting to know if anyone's yeah, got one. If you're listening to this and your dog will set or point and it is a Springer or a Retriever, we are now all curious. <laughs> I think, you know, you see them on like Instagram and uh, on Facebook. You see uh, young, you know, pups in a litter and they pull in like, you know, a wing on, on, on a fishing rod and they all instinctively point. And they remind me, they make me giggle every time I watch it like a fool because they remind me almost of like little baby dinosaurs. They're almost like that stealth stuff, you know, as a pack. And I think it's absolutely fascinating. And it's definitely genetically there, the capability. Whereas I think if you put that same feather in with the Logos Spaniel, perhaps they would, they would just annihilate it. <laughs> they would, <laughs> there would be no control. Absolutely. And it's, it's really interesting because I've got some chickens at home. And they can get into my, I have a kind of fenced off area for the dogs and they can get in. And my young spaniel, she now doesn't chase, but she would, if she were given a chance, she would chase. And she'd probably end up, end up earlier in the early days, me wanting to pin one of the birds down. My setter pup has never done that. He All he does, I mean, I will just leave, leave him in there and leave the chickens in there. Because all he'll do is just point them. And then he just stealthily walks up to them once they're through the feds and he then chases and has a bit of a run around but when they're in there the setters that just won't touch them it's just purely pointing um which is yeah really interesting i actually have two that do it oh do you yeah um they'll do it on pheasant and partridge they they do it when they're poults um and they don't they then stop doing it when they get to adults and i don't know whether it's because poults they know don't fly very well um, and as soon as they start flying, they just stop pointing at them. Um, but yeah, I've got two spaniels, and then also we've got two clumber cross spaniels. Um, and because they air scent, they also will hold um, a static. It's not a point like a pointer does, but they will lift a leg up and go completely rigid if there's something in an area that needs flushing out until you tell them to flush. And I think any, I think if I'm right, any air scenting dog is able to point. Um, but obviously it comes more instinctively to your setters and your pointers and your HPRs. I was just going to ask, because um, obviously, Lucy, you come up near me up here in Yorkshire and Lancashire and, and up, up this part of the country. Is that because there aren't many people who do what you do? Is it quite a small sort of pool of people um, who've got that well, skill and ability? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of people up your way um, who do it, who I know and everything. Hmm. Um, but I suppose I come up purely because that's that's where I can work really work my dogs I mean I can obviously um, train them and everything on the partridge and I could work them on the partridge but obviously yeah the enjoyment is being up on the moors Um, but there are I suppose there's more people around the Northumberland area because there seems to be a lot of people there was a mass exodus when they retired they all went up to north literally Northumberland to Muggleswick I know a load of people literally just did this mass move up to Muggleswick uh, with their points and setters and have set up there. Um, but yeah, I suppose there's a lot of us who are interested and run them. And so we, yeah, we make this mass journey up north and spend most of our time driving up and down the A1 and M1. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you have to go where the moors are though, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
There is one bit that I've realised I should have probably mentioned. I haven't actually explained how, because when we do the uh, grouse count, we do it in a, a like a quadrant of four, uh, like four sides. Um, so when we go out and count, we actually do it in a square. Um, so, um, I mean, it's obviously easiest then, it's just four, four sides. Um, but what you'll, uh, this obviously affects uh, the dogs as well, because the dogs then have to uh, work different winds. So you'll, one side you'll obviously have, uh, you'll be working into the wind, so that's nice and easy. Another side you'll be working downwind. Um, and then the other two, you'll have cheek winds. Um, so again, that's very good. Well, very good for the dogs. With a young dog, it just has to pick it up and learn it, uh, really. And you just have to obviously be watching your dogs and um, make sure there's, they're on the, the, they're on, well, make sure they're on the right wind. But actually, to be fair, most dogs, uh, the working ones, will very much pick that wind up straight away and immediately turn the way they uh, turn the way they're working. Um, but yes, I just thought that that's quite a important part of uh, what we do. So we don't just okay, we're at at this point on the moor, we're just going to walk for eternity in one direction, because what happens is they do uh, quadrants on the um, on the moor, because then that particular count quadrant uh will then take they'll generally take an average and everything and it can just you know give an air uh, give a, an idea of the birds in that area um and it's the same it's that same quadrant that is counted every time so every time in march every time in july and every year it's the same counts done so on that like the similarity from a pheasant point of view would be like dogging in so we kind of know where our birds are so that we can shoot them but from dogging in, we want the birds to go in a certain direction. Does that matter when they're pushed by the dogs on the counts? Does it matter where they go because they'll come back because they're territorial? You've hit the nail on the head there, yeah. But it doesn't matter where they go because they're territorial. They'll automatically um, come back to their areas. So we'd just like to take a moment to thank Lucy massively for taking the time to do this podcast with us. It's normally... Uh, it's a normally... It's a little bit longer than Norma, but that's because I think it's such an exciting and informative topic, and I'm really glad we got the information from Lucy. And now we are now all more informed about what happens in grouse shooting and grouse counting, and with the English setters, etc. Um, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Lucy, very much, and we hope you listen in next week. Thank you for listening to LWDG Pod Dog with me, Joe Parrott. Now, we all know training a dog takes time, energy and patience, but our lives can be really, really busy. Don't worry, the LWDG has got you covered. Join us for our free planning workshop where we'll show you how to use short 10-minute training sessions each day to fast forward your dog's education. Our experts have years of experience in training dogs and will help you get started on the right foot. Register now and start making progress with your furry friend today. Go to our Facebook page, The Ladies Working Dog Group, and click on the pinned post. Or visit www.thelwdg.com. Music.